Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Hemel, and I'm an historian for the United States Air Force Medical Service. I'm also a historian and tour guide for Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Today, I'm going to be talking about the Battle for Noville. This is a town north of Bastogne, and it was a decisive fight uh, leading to the siege of Bastogne. This is an important battlefield that just about all of our tours of Europe visit. Um, our Band of Brothers tour, our D-Day to the Rhine tour, and my Footsteps of Patton tour. So that gives you an idea how significant this battle is. That's all the into it. I'm going to show you this. This right here is a tank retriever. It looks like a Sherman tank, but you can tell it's not one. It looks a little off. It's got devices all around it. It looks kind of strange. And on December 19th, that tank is going to pull up in front of this house in Noville. And that simple act is going to cost the commander of the American armor there, his, uh, his command, and the commander of the airborne portion fighting there, his life. We're going to get into that in a minute. Let's start with December 16, 1944, when the German army basically busts out of the border between Germany and Belgium and Luxembourg. So you can see here, we get an arrow going, the objective is Antwerp, the port city. Uh, Adolf Hitler's desire is to break a line between the British and the American forces. Um, but if you look down here, you're going to see a vital sort of crossroads. That's Bastogne. And that is the hard nut to crack uh, for the Germans. Traveling north of that is going to be the second Panzer Division. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, basically, they are armed with Panther tanks and Mark IVs. They're going to have roughly about 130 of these tanks combined with uh, assault guns. Um, they're going to be barreling east, you know, in hopes of getting to Antwerp. And, you know, I mentioned the importance of Bastogne. You can see here, Bastogne's real important. It's got seven roads coming together. And in that foul winter weather, uh, not only tanks are going to perform better on open roads, but so will the supply vehicles, the trucks coming up behind, the towed artillery. If they're forced to go around and use the fields, they're going to get slowed down greatly. This is why Bastogne is so vital uh, during the winter campaign in the Ardennes. Um, when this happens, when the Germans bust through the line, Dwight D. Eisenhower is going to send three armored divisions into this fray. First, he's going to send the 7th Army from the north heading south, then the 9th Armored Division north from the south, followed by the 10th Armored Division. Now, this here is the 10th Armored Division in this photograph. And an armored division is divided into three elements, a Combat Command A, Combat Command B, and a Combat Command R for reserve. Combat Commands A and R are going to head into Luxembourg to defend the southern shoulder of the bulge, while Combat Command B is going to rush up into Bastogne itself. The commander is um, a William uh, Roberts, uh, Colonel William Roberts. He's going to arrive in Bastogne with his command, where he's going to meet with Troy Middleton, the Corps commander. Now, Middleton has had his 28th Division shattered by the German offensive. His 9th Armored Division has also been cut to pieces. Uh, he's outnumbered two to one, but he's keeping his calm. And um, Roberts basically says, you know, sir, what do you need me to do? And Middleton says, I need you to break your force into three elements. Now, you can see Bastogne here. What he's going to need him to do is send a force sort of to the southeast uh, to defend this road, <coughs> one to the east to defend this approach to Bastogne, and then finally one up to Noville. Um, now, this is going to be Team de Sobry under um, Major William de Sobry. Now, he is right there. Um, when Roberts gives DeSobre this assignment, uh, DeSobre asks him, he says, you know, sir, when, uh, do I have the ability to make the decision when to pull back, or do I need to check with you first? And Roberts tells him, he says, listen, uh, you're new to combat. You're going to reach a point tomorrow where you're going to think you have to pull back. When you get to that point, I want you to pick up the phone and call me. And so basically he's saying the decision won't be yours, it will be mine. Sobri agrees, and he heads north with about 400 men 
and 15 tanks. Now, he doesn't know it, but he's going to be up against 16,000 men and 130 tanks and assault guns. So 400 versus 16,000, 15 tanks versus 130, roughly. Um, DeSobre has no idea what Noville looks like. He has no idea what the enemy is going to be facing, but he's going to head up north to this town. Now, um, I can tell you briefly that um, Noville is this nice little picturesque town. The church is really the sort of centerpiece. It's a simple crossroads town, but it's kind of an island out on, on sort of a flat plain. But about 400 yards north of it, there are rises that lead to hills. Uh, of course, it's so dark and muggy in this area, so thick that DeSobre has no idea about this. So once he arrives, his men start knocking out windows with their rifle butts so they won't shatter in the coming battle. Uh, he rests a third of the men, and he's going to send out um, three patrols into the fog. Um, they are going to go, one is going to head directly east, the obvious position that he believes the Germans will be coming from, one to the north, and one sort of northwest. And this is to monitor for the approaching Germans. Now, he orders the, the men at all these outposts not to lay mines because he knows troops from the 28th Division and other elements are going to be retreating this way, and he's hoping that he can recruit them into the fight uh, to defend Bastogne. Um, I talked about the fog. Here's a kind of an example of what the fog looks like. You can see this German coming under this fence, and you almost can't see it, but that is a scout car behind him. This is the kind of fog this battle is going to be fought on. Um, and sure enough, uh, throughout the night, troops are going to be coming through uh, this area here. But right around 2 a.m., they sort of end. And uh, uh, the patrolmen, they actually see a group of cap tracks approaching their area. And they don't know if they're Americans or Germans, so they stay quiet. Uh, and when they hear the German language coming from these half tracks, they realize it's the enemy and they lob grenades into the open beds of these half tracks. Uh, the grenades explode, Germans are killed and wounded, others pour out of the half tracks and engage the Americans. There's a, a small firefight and the Germans pull back, the Americans pull back to their tanks and say, you know, hey guys, why didn't you support us? And the tank commanders had to tell them, listen, the fog was so thick, we thought we were gonna be firing on you. Um, but there were no casualties. I think one or two guys were, were hurt in the face. Um, but DeSobre, meanwhile, back in Noville, had taken that when he woke up, he heard this firing. Uh, and when the troops came back and reported that they had made contact with the Germans, he pulled all three of his outposts back into Noville because he realizes that, you know, they got to get ready for the, the, the coming battle. And sure enough, uh, some German tanks roll down the main road. They blow up two of his Shermans. Uh, this is around 9 a.m. There's a lot of maneuvering going around. The, the Sobe said he could hear the tanks, you know, moving north of him. I mean, he knew what was coming. Um, and when they finally come straight down this road and destroy two of his tanks, the fight is on. Um, now, just as the Germans start their attack, a platoon of tank destroyers, which look like tanks but have heavier guns, come rolling up this road uh, to, <clears throat> to, excuse me, to provide him support. And he said that, you know, he kind of kept the tank destroyer commander with him at all times and would assign the tank destroyers out uh, as the battle progressed where they were needed. So uh, the Germans, you know, like I said, come down this road. There's also Germans on the left and the right side. And right around 9 a.m., the fog rises. And for the first time, uh, the Soviet men can see what they're up against. And they realize the amount of tanks and infantry from pouring down those hills. Uh, the tank destroyers open up, the tanks open up, they're knocking out tanks as they roll down the hill. Some get stuck in the mud over here, and a single tank destroyer destroys three of them before they're knocked out by fire. Um, the Soviet men have the advantage of cover in the town while the Germans are exposed as they attack. And what eventually happens is a lot of the Soviet men end up shooting the Germans, Germ I'm sorry, the German infantry supporting these tanks, and the tanks are going to find themselves alone in this attack. Um, the battle is going to rage for about an hour, and in the middle of it, a pig comes running down the center street, uh, and the Americans are all yelling it and coaxing this pig as it just bolts down the street. Uh, they're trying to get it into cover, and it finally goes into one of the houses, 
and the men decide to uh, you know, use it as a mascot and not sacrifice it to their hunger. And that was a small bit of, of humor in a very tense situation. During the fighting, a German sniper uh, is going to get across from the Soviet Union's headquarters across the church and start firing at his men until a patrol kills him. Another sniper is actually going to make it into the church tower, and just about every man with a rifle and, and most of the tanks open fire on the church so that it looks like this by the end of the battle. Um, sort of the last element of this engagement is that an American tank rolls down that north-south road and opens fire on the troops. And one of the Americans says, I don't care whose side he's on, open fire on him, and they knocked out the tank and turned out to have been occupied by Germans. Well, with no infantry to support them, the German tanks do pull back to the north to those northern hills. And the Sobri realizes, you know, hey, we stopped this gigantic force once. We won't be able to do it again. So he realizes he needs to pull back, but he remembers that um, you know, Roberts had told him, you know, call me. So he picks up his field telephone and he contacts Roberts. And Roberts tells him something that I think kind of chilled the Sobri's bones. Um, he told him to hold on to the phone line. You know, so here's the Sobri with shells and everything kind of blowing up around him. And he's sitting there on hold. Uh, and the reason he's on hold is because Roberts is going to walk out of his headquarters at the Hotel Le Burn in Bastogne. Uh, the main north-south uh, street right near the uh, McCulloch Square and the, the Sherman tank. And he's going to walk out of that office, <laughs> and what does he see? But paratroopers <laughs> all marching by. And he sees Brigadier General Gerald Higgins, the uh, deputy commander of the 101st, and he explains his problem to him. And just then appears uh, Colonel Robert Sink, uh, and he turns to the 1st Battalion, 506. Uh, Robert Sink commands the entire 506. And the commander of the 1st Battalion is a James LaPrade. And he turns to LaPrade and says, head north, you know. And so he basically, without stopping to rest or anything, these troops from 1st Battalion 506, they're just going to head north. They're not even going to pause or anything. And there's uh, James LaPrade getting a medal. And so LaPrade is going to head north here. Um, so Roberts, you know, gets back on the phone and tells the sober, he said, listen, if you really want to pull back, you have my permission. but..." I've got about 400 paratroopers coming to help you out. And immediately, DeSobre realizes he can fight this fight and um, you know, that they can hold the ground. But he realizes that in order to hold the ground, they're going to need to go on the offensive. And so he you know, actually sends a jeep back into Bastogne to pick up the parade, because he figures it's going to take a while for those troops to come north. It's about a three-mile hike. And so the parade arrives. And this is the plan they come up with that LaPrade is going to be in command of three companies. And so Company A is going to charge the hills to the north. Company B is going to do the hills to the west. And Company C is going to charge the hills to the east. Each one of these attacks will be supported by tanks uh, and, and what, what infantry uh, the Silvery can spare. Uh, once this plan is laid out, the Silvery realizes that, you know, he's going to need also to tell the company commanders uh, what the plan is. So he sends another jeep back and gets the three company commanders to join him. And he's actually going to take them around the town and show them, you know, what they need to do, you know, to all of these objectives. <coughs> now, uh, the Sobri realizes a few things. One, there are blown up enemy tanks and American tanks all clogging the roads here in Noville. And he's got, he's got paratroopers coming. So he orders a tank retrieval unit to start towing the tanks out of here to make room for this offensive. Meanwhile, he knows that the uh, paratroopers that are going to be coming in, don't have, some of them don't have rifles or helmets uh, or just the basic equipment to fight. So he orders a Lieutenant Rice to head south, get as many supplies as he can in the town of Foy that they have set up a supply depot, and distribute those to the paratroopers. And, uh, you know, basically, Weiss does his job. There's an open bed truck full of rifles. They would shout out, who needs a rifle? And if a paratrooper raised his hand, they'd throw him a rifle. They had boxes of ammunition, boxes of grenades. And so the paratroopers, as they made their way north, just loaded up. And when they got to Foy, uh, they kind of paused because the order was that there would be an artillery barrage uh, put forth by the Americans. And at that point, they were to charge into Noville. 
Uh, so they kind of wait on this hill. Once that barrage uh, hits, they take off sort of walking and they start running into Noville. They see a town on fire as they're getting close. One green brand new paratrooper uh, with 1st Battalion actually turned around and started to run back. And a veteran basically clocks him and says, you know, get moving forward. Uh, another paratrooper jumps over two jeeps that are kind of like crashed together. And as he does it, he said he looked down and saw two of his buddies dead and had to change direction in midair <clears throat> before he landed. Now, these paratroopers, they don't stop. They keep running until they get through the town and to their areas. The Sobri is witnessing this and he said, I can't believe these paratroopers are running and their officers are keeping them in order and preparing them to fan out. The Sobri was very impressed with the tactical abilities of the 506. Uh, two of the paratroopers run just north of the town where they spot two tanks dueling with the Germans and they, they keep moving around. And he, uh, one of the paratroopers comments that the fire was so intense that he felt like there were four American tanks firing on the Germans, not two. Uh, he said he was very impressed with what they were capable of. Um, so without any pause or delay, the paratroopers go charging to their objective. And just as they start to get up these hills, the German tanks start rolling down again and basically catch the paratroopers right in action. Um, one paratrooper talked about duck, jumping into a, a hen's nest and having a cigarette with a couple of buddies. And when they realized they were under fire, they tried to run to a haystack, which a German set on fire. Uh, he ran down one of the main streets, followed by a German tank, dove into a house where some paratroopers were, and they all ran out the back door as the tank opened fire on the house. This is the kind of close combat we're talking about. Another incident, um, one of the Soviet men ran across the street in downtown Noville, right near the church, and he said he was so close to a German tank he could spit on it. Uh, he made it into a house across the street, and he and another soldier started firing bazooka rounds at this, uh, probably was a panther tank. All the Americans thought they were tigers. There were no tigers there. Um, but they fire the first bazooka round at this tank, and it just clinks off. And they keep firing, and these rounds, they fire 11 rounds that are just clinking right off this tank. Uh, the tank, meanwhile, turns its turret towards the house and is trying to figure out where this little fly is that's bothering it. Fires a round into the second floor. The guys keep firing. A sniper opens up on them but can't get their range or the angle. And on the 12th round, they finally hit a bazooka round between the turret and the body of the tank, and it freezes, it welds it basically. They decide to fire one more round to make sure that tank is knocked out. But just as they're loading it, there is a huge concussion and they're thrown to the floor. And when they kind of wake up and shake off the dust, they realize that a tank destroyer had come from the back of the house and done the kill round on the German tank. Uh, and just then another tank destroyer pulled up next to it and fired at a German tank that was following right behind it. So again, this is a sort of tight fighting that's going on. Uh, there are German tanks on this hill over here, and at one point they're dueling, the American tanks are dueling with these tanks in this area, and DeSobri said he was watching it like a tennis match, with his head going back and forth from the round, and finally a soldier in a, uh, in a scout vehicle that had a little 37 millimeter, <laughs> uh, most of the tanks have 75 and 76 millimeter cannons, but this guy with a little 37 millimeter is watching it, and he says, you know, Major, your men can't hit anything. And he ducks into his vehicle, fires a bunch of rounds at this German tank in the distance, and his rounds actually hit the fuel tank that are put on the back of the tank for extra fuel. The fuel drips into the engine, tank explodes, and the guy jumps out of his vehicle and does this to the Sobri, and the Sobri applauded him. Um, so even though the airborne guys have been caught out in the open and the offensive did not succeed, they are still fighting toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Germans. At one point, a paratrooper comes running through the town holding his own intestines in his hand, and a couple of paratroopers basically tackle him and lay a raincoat next to him and spill his guts onto the raincoat and clean them with canteen water before putting them back into his chest cavity, taping them up and getting him to a hospital. Um, you know, the German tanks, uh, the, the, <coughs> the paratroopers have dug foxholes at this point, and as the, the German tanks roll in, 
they start firing and the concussion is so intense, it's throwing the paratroopers out of their foxholes and they have to climb back in. But they just keep up rifle fire on the, uh, on the advancing infantry. And again, they separate the infantry from the tanks. The tanks have no support. They have to turn around and go back up the hill. Um, so once again, they, they've held off this offensive. Now, once the, the, the firing kind of calms down, the Sobri goes into his headquarters with uh, Laprade, and they start planning for the next day's uh, events, you know, the defense of, of Noville for the next day. And as they're planning, a number of officers come to visit them, like General Higgins, who I mentioned earlier, uh, the head of a glider troop. I think he was going up there to see if, you know, they needed to deploy there, if he could deploy to the west, which he does. Uh, and even Colonel Sink to check on the situation. And once they all leave, uh, they're laying out their plans, looking at what they can do. And just then, a lieutenant goes and comes into the headquarters and says, Sir, we have finished towing all vehicles out of this area, and I'm going to go back to Bastogne. And, you know, so he says, Fine. Um, it, unfortunately, this officer had pulled his tank retriever vehicle in front of the headquarters right here. And this come to target of the Germans because they're looking at it from a distance saying, what is that odd looking vehicle doing in front of that building? It must be something special. So a German uh, tank fired two rounds at the building. You can see it here in the center of this photograph. This picture was taken from the church, excuse me, from the church um, and two rounds enter this building and there will one will kill uh, La Prade, uh, the other one's gonna bury the sobri and a mountain of debris is going to get cuts on his head. He's going to, he's going to lose one eye and he's going to be pulled out of this building and he's basically out of the battle. Um, he was injured too badly. They put him in an ambulance to head south and the ambulance actually is intercepted by the Germans who let it pass uh, because it's an ambulance. But that means the Germans are already getting around Basco. Um, immediately, a Major Robert Harwick with the 101st, he'll be coming up into the town and as the highest ranking officer, he's gonna take over uh, LaPrade's job and a Major Husted will take over for De Sobri for the 10th Armored. Um, these two officers are gonna complete the plan and set up the defense of the town and uh, you know basically just settle in for the night. Uh, the next morning, people are gonna wake up. A lot of the paratroopers said that, you know, the place of like Dante's Inferno, all the buildings were on fire, it was still dark mist, you know, kind of clung to the town. And um, they said that they could hear horses and cows screaming in the barns as they burned to death. So that's the kind of atmosphere you're looking at. It's kind of what uh, Noville looked like the next morning. You can see the, the, how it's been shattered. Um, the Germans are going to attack again. Uh, the, the, the airborne and the, and the tankers are going to defend it the best they can till about noon. Uh, and you know it's the same kind of close quarters intense fighting uh and once again they separate the germans from their tank the infantry from the tanks in fact at one point because the town was on fire the german infantry as they advanced were basically silhouetted against the flames <coughs> and offered perfect targets for the airborne um one soldier with team sobri saw a platoon leader a, a lieutenant from 101st gathered up a bunch of his own infantry and armored infantry from 10th Armored, led them into a field, spotted a group of Germans, assigned everybody a German, and said, fire, and they wiped them out. He said, I couldn't believe how efficient uh, this airborne lieutenant was. He was very impressed with him. So about noon, uh, there's a realization even back in back. So this is an impeccable position. And so the idea is for the troops to pull back uh, to roughly where the town of Foy is, uh, or at least right next to it. And to distract the Germans, they launch an attack using the 501st uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment and a single platoon from Easy Company 506. They're going to attack into Foy to fake out the Germans, and this is going to give the opportunity for the two officers to gather their men and retreat out of Noville. Now, as they're organizing this, they're getting the wounded onto half tracks and other vehicles. They basically form a, a long caravan uh, with an armored, with a, um, a scout car in the front, a, a couple of half tracks, followed by tanks and tank destroyers and other vehicles interspersed. And the plan is the last vehicle engineers hack the church tower or steeple 
with explosives. And so the idea is to ignite that and blow it up in hope that the debris will block the road for the Germans. So as they're preparing this, again, the fog settles down over the area, giving perfect cover to the Americans, and they start pulling out. This is a very slow caravan getting out of Noville. And um, you know, the last vehicles, uh, they're, they're, like I said, their job is to blow up the tower, while the front vehicles are proceeding very slowly. Uh, unfortunately, the lead skip car takes off full speed and heads into, heads into Bastogne, doesn't even stop at point. And uh, the following half tracks are doing their job moving slowly through the fog. But something tragic kind of happens. The driver of the lead um, half track, he has basically armor plating in front of him with a metal visor that you should put down in the event of combat. Well, that thing accidentally slides down and blocks his vision. And he kind of reacts with a jerk. And the, the officer next to him thinks he's been hit. So he reaches over and yanks the parking brake for the vehicle and it stops and it starts a chain reaction, almost an accordion effect of all the cars bumping into each other. I think uh, Wild Bill Garnier would call it bada bing, bada boom, bada bing. Um, anyways, uh, the, the, the column freezes and it, it, it's, people start getting out of their vehicle trying to figure out what's wrong and the officers are trying to get them back in. Uh, actually, you're going to have 101st Airborne guys in the confusion getting into tanks, either driving them or, or you know, working as loaders for the, for the guns, uh, anything to get this column moving. Uh, as they push uh, south to their right, a machine gun, a German machine gun opens up from a barn. So two tanks take off through the fog uh, and knock it out. But they didn't realize this, but two German tanks had already penetrated through the line and they blow up the tanks. And the guys in the column said in the middle of all this fog, they saw this huge orange ball of the American tank being hit. Um, a bit of confusion ensues, but the column pushes south. Tanks are opening fire on the German tanks in their way, in their way, and uh, they slowly start making it into uh, four. Now, remember, the end of the column is the last to go, and the engineers set a fuse uh, in hopes of blowing up this tower. And they said that they're pulling away. The, the anxiety was just building because they didn't know if the fuse was going to work. But finally, they see a huge explosion. Uh, the tower of the church has been blown up. That is what it looked like at the end of the battle. Um, and with that, that was really sort of the exclamation point on the Battle of Noville. As the men make their way into Ford, there's a single officer standing on the road greeting them. Um, this, is Lieutenant, uh, this is Colonel Robert Sink of the 506, and he realizes what these men have been through. So he's standing there shaking hands with everybody. Uh, telling them what a good job they did. Uh, by the end of this battle, uh, both the Sobri team, which had been about 400 men, had lost half its numbers. Uh, the first of the 506 had lost half its numbers. So they both had about 400 men and lost about 200 to casualties. Uh, of the 15 tanks that went into the town, I think three came out. Um, most of the tank destroyers did survive the battle. But they took out around 15 to 20, maybe even 25 enemy tanks, wiped out their infantry, uh, all the infantry that attacked, and really stymied this armored division, uh, which all the, 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 actually the armored division, its only desire, the Panzer division, was to take Floyd, the, I'm sorry, to take Noville. It was not even supposed to go into Bastogne, um, but they stopped it. Um, so it was a great sacrifice that the Sobri's men make and the paratroopers make, but it makes the defense of Bastogne possible. It gives the 101st Airborne time to get in and deploy west and east and south so that when the Germans do surround the town, they're ready to meet them. Um, so that is the, the battle of four. I just want to end on one little note here. Now, when we take tours there, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the tour, Stephen Ambrose historical tours, takes just about all of our European tours to this location because of its importance. But we always want to point out this sign here, that, that this little placard in the town behind the church. And you can see it's just a simple uh, plaque with names on it. Uh, the story behind it is that when Bastogne was liberated originally by the Americans, uh, the townspeople poured into the street. They cheered their liberators. They you know, offered them drink. And somebody with a camera took pictures of this great, joyous moment. 
Well, after the Germans captured the town from uh, Team de Sobri and the paratroopers on December 20th, um, it, a German uh, inspection team, or however you want to call them, comes in later and finds the film. And they find only 16 folk people, locals, in the pictures with the Americans. They make them gather out in front of the church the next morning and have them clean with their hands all the debris out of the road so the German vehicles can pass. And when it's done, they read out a list of eight names out of the 16 people. And the eight people, they let go back to their homes. The other eight people, they lead into a field where they have dug three graves and systematically shoot and kill those civilians and drop them into the grave for the sole purpose that these people celebrated their liberation. So with that, uh, that is the story of Noville. If you'd like to read more about this, I just wrote an article for WW2 Quarterly Magazine that'll be coming out at the end of March. Uh, it'll have everything I talked about in much more detail. I encourage you to read it. And I encourage you to come on one of our Stephen Ambrose historical tours and come to Noville. See the town I've been talking about. I've showed you a one-dimensional picture of Batstone. If you want the 3D experience, we're going to go there. We're going to spend some time there, tell the story, and we'd love to have you come along. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to get back to researching some history, and I hope everybody has a great day. And please, please contact us and join us on our tour. Thank you.